This is on Welcome. Thank you so much. Okay, Sikha today is about Yitzvat, coming up a few days. Um, I want to, before before getting into the Sikha, as usual, I always talk about something else. Um, this year is on a Shabbos. Yitzvat holds on on a Shabbos, Parker's bow. The exact same calendar setting when it happened, like the year 1950, when the previous Rebbe passed away, it was also a Shabbos, 8 in the morning, 8.20 in the morning. And uh, so the fact that it comes out to be on the same day of the week has some means something. It means that whatever happens then, we're not talking about the Estalicus, but the uh, the uh, influence that his neshama has, being that it's not limited to a body, when that day took place, the whole generation, especially those that follow him, are very immensely affected, subconsciously and also consciously. All the Torah, all the Avoido, everything he lived for comes to head and it explodes for all of Judaism sense. And sometimes you get good thoughts. A hero tshuva, a thought of doing tshuva, you don't know where it came from, comes from that tzaddik, uh, the passing. And that repeats itself every single year, especially a year where the calendar setting is exactly the same as the first year. So I want to just mention something about Shabbos. The big Fabrengan is going to be my Toya Shabbos, Saturday night, with Allah Shvat, when the Rebbe formally, a year later, at the Fabrengan, accepted upon himself to be the leader, the mantle of leadership, the, the Rebbe accepted it. The whole story, how, how much the Rebbe refused. The Rebbe said, if you're going to nudge me anymore, I'm going to run away, escape, and you'll never find me again. People said, we'll look for you, we'll find you. Uh, Rebbe gave an excuse. I was never given any kind of signs, meaning from his father-in-law, that I should take over the uh, mantle of leadership, become the next Rebbe. When the, when the Chassidim heard that, they decided, let's go to the Ohel, the gravesite of the re previous Rebbe. Let's tell him, please give your son-in-law a sign. And after that visit at the Ohel, the, never, the Rebbe never gave that excuse again, that I can't accept leadership because I have no green light from my father-in-law, <laughs> I guess. The Rebbe were very much wanted to stay private. The Rebbe and the Rebbetson were two extremely, by, forget about all the holiness, because by nature, their personality extremely introverted and private. And for the Rebbe to be a leader of Klal Yisrael is against his nature. He said it, it's, not against, it's against my, the fiber of my being. Didn't use those not the exact words. So you can imagine. Uh, the Rebbe was very humble. No, you can believe when the Rebbe says something, you can believe that he's telling the truth. It's against my nature to go out and, you know, and lead and become a public figure. Very, very private. You see how private the Rebbe was. She didn't ever show herself out of a bringing. And whenever someone noticed her and gave her extra covering, she never showed up in that store again. The Rebbe was just like, they were perfect shidduch. I'm talking, you know, I know my, it might sound a little uh, inappropriate to say that about such great people. But that was the Rebbe's personality, being very much private, not known. And even when the Rebbe became Rebbe, do you think we really know all his greatness? We know, someone once remarked, I think it was Rabbi uh, Soloveitchik, said the Rebbe is a tzaddik nister. He's a hidden tzaddik. <laughs> you think you, you understand, you, you, you've captured his greatness? Achen vei, that's the way you say in Yiddish, woe is to us if all that the Rebbe is, is what you think he is. It's a lot, much, much greater. But anyway, throughout that year, it was such a tough, it was, the Chassidim worked so hard to finally get the Rebbe to agree. So that's this coming, my Tzai Shabbat, Saturday night will be the anniversary of the Rebbe officially taking over the Rebbe Shaf, as you would call that. Uh, a year later, 1951, Yud Alev Shvat. Um, so I want to just mention something interesting. I, I, I think I mentioned it, in not this class, this year, but some of you might have heard from me last year. It's not my own, my, my own English. <laughs> I don't know the source. I think it's from the Arizal, but I'm not sure. Um, there are four meals on Shabbos. Four? Three, right? Um, Barely three. Friday night meal, Shabbos day meal, Shalash, oh, Shabbos Shalashudis, 
and the after Shabbos, Lava Malka belongs to Shabbos. It's called the escorting of the queen. That's also part of Shabbos. When you say goodbye, farewell to the Shabbos, it's, it's still connected to Shabbos, which is why we don't say Tachnun in the benching, you know, uh, and also if you're going to bed early before Chatzos Halayla, we don't say Tachnun in the Shema until Chatzos, which is around 12, well, after 12, not exactly 12. These four meals correspond to four cities in Eretz Yisrael and also correspond to um, Eish, Ruach, Mayim, and Ofer, the four elements that we all know of. Friday night, which city corresponds to Friday night? What, what, what element? Fire. Yishalayim. It's called the city of fire. It says, with fire I will build, the Beis Hamikdash, which is located in Yishalayim. With fire it was burnt, and it will be rebuilt with fire. The Mizbeach, called the altar in English, is a key, the most important, one of the most important pieces of furniture in the Beis Hamikdash. And it says, a fire shall never be extinguished on the Mizbeach. Eish, Tuk Eish al Mizbeach lo Tukan, it should never be extinguished. So the Mizbeach, the city of Yerushalayim, corresponds to fire. And when people go there, you feel a passion. There's a tremendous passion when you go to the Kaisal Marovi. Everyone is on, our Neshamas are on fire. Friday night, what do we see on the table? Shabbos. Candles, candles, fire. fire. And how do we feel Friday night when Shabbos just begins? Chayis. The week is over. Now, finally, Shabbos has arrived. You feel the contrast between the weekday and Shabbos. The contrast is what warms you, makes you enthusiastic and passionate. Shabbos morning. What's Shabbos morning? Water. Why water? Water is a thirst quencher. The fire, the passion for the Shabbos has been quenched with the holiness of Shabbos. So by the morning, we feel our thirst is no longer there. We, we, we have it already. You know, while you're drinking, you don't feel thirsty. <laughs> well, and, but it also represents water for a different reason, because the water is Torah. We have the Kriya Satoya, we have a laning. There's a lot of learning goes on Shabbos morning. It's not supposed to be, at least. Um, people are questioning. I go to we sleep more, don't we, on Shabbos? We're supposed to learn more on Shabbos. Uh, so Shabbos morning is a time for a lot of Torah learning. Uh, and it goes... And when I mean morning, I mean the entire half first half day. What city is water? What? Tiberia. 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 Near the Kinneret, right? Tiberius is water. Third meal? This new to you or you've heard this before? Not gonna have a meal. Yeah. yeah, I figured it was it sounds like you know I could tell but from the <laughs> looking at your faces that I heard that already. <laughs> <laughs> But sometimes it's like, oh, okay, then that then I know you heard everything. It was a half. So the third meal is so about like the city and the elements, not about yeah, this is so cool. Oh, okay, it's cool. Okay. So the third meal is what? Shalashudis, where we don't eat too much. In fact, in Chabad, we can just eat almost nothing and just have a brain in. Yeah. And have a mimer being said by uh, by someone reviewing it by heart, and that's your third meal. Uh, even if you are going to eat, there's no obligation to have lecha mishnah, to have two, two chalvas, or to even wash. You can be yoytza just with fruits. And in Chabad, we're, for reasons I'm not going to go into right now, we're not, in, we're not uh, you know, into the idea of eating so much more a spiritual type of food. So it must be air because we eat air. Air. Because air is airy. Class, you got it. my barium, so that's like air. Like... No, it's airy. It's very spiritual. It's airy. <laughs> You go to Tzvah, you feel like you're in outer space. Mm-hmm. Feels like you're in a different world, different planet. <laughs> you know, people are talking there. They're, you know, it's like, it's are you into uh, this the sector or that the sector? This mimer or that mimer? It's not good for commerce. It's <laughs> people are very uh, oh, they're very spiritual. Yes. I'm confused about the meals. You said Shabbos morning. I was thinking like. That's not like whenever you go to somebody's house, like at one p.m. Like, okay. like morning. We're always oh, late. People wake up around twelve o'clock, you know. Yeah. Especially it's the morning. I don't. It doesn't really mean morning. It means the first half of the day, so which is also overlap into the second half. Meal? Yeah, yeah, it's a Shabbos. Shabbos day meal is the second, but then what's the third meal? Chabad doesn't do that. Like I Chabad think- is more lenient about the third meal instead of having to eat something. Some people do. We sit and hear a mimer being reviewed, learn, but learn 
you know, things that are very spiritual, holy, um, a mimer, reviewed by heart by somebody. I, used to, I did it also a few times. Uh, and you have your eyes closed trying to memorize word for word of the mimer. It's not easy. And it's a very, it's a very beautiful, holy atmosphere. The nigunim are sung. Time for nigunim. Songs of all the rabbeim. You feel uplifted. Who needs to eat? In fact, it says the third, the re reason why we don't eat too much and maybe not eat at all is because the hint for the third meal is hinted in the word in the words in Chumash, lo, lo ye ye, with, with a man. It will not. So it's, I don't remember the exact wording uh, of where the hint is from, but it's, 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 a, it's hinted in the Torah itself, but it's not exactly the same as the first two meals. What element of that? Air. Then comes the Malava Malka. Malava Malka is earth. And who's, which city? Hebron. We have all the great Sadiqim buried in the earth of Hebron. On White Side Shabbos, hopefully, you don't feel, whew, finally I can get back my phone again, you know. Shoot, that was tough. The Shabbos was a really uh, tough day to hold back from all the things I wanted. You're thinking already about after Shabbos on Shabbos. It's not a very big, not a very Shabbos to Shabbos. So, Mike's Shabbos is a time where we feel down. That's why we have the summit to revive us from the, give us a perk of Chayis. Because who doesn't want, who doesn't want Shabbos to continue? We have a love of Malka, but we feel the down. And that's why uh, it's called, it's compared to Earth, which is the heaviest of the four elements. One, one more, one second. But it's interesting. Earth has something that all the others don't have. Fire can be extinguished. Water evaporates. Air <laughs> is always moving around. <laughs> Earth stays where it is. If you want to hide something, secure, you bury it on, you know, in Earth. If you want to ma maintain what you accomplished on Shabbos, all the, what you accumulated throughout the Shabbos, all the Kedusha, the holiness of Shabbos, what holds in a capsule all that you accomplished, the fire, the water, the air, the earth on Meisalei Shabbos. Which is why it's customary for Bachrim to learn Nigla, the revealed part of Torah, the earth of Torah, not the water and the fire and the air, but the more concrete halachas, Gemara on Meisalei Shabbos. The Seder Yeshiva, when the Bachrim was on Meisalei Shabbos, there'd be a lot of learning Nigla, Gemara, and someone would say, each, every week a different Bachrim would say a pilpul. You know what a pilpul is? Mm -hmm. Not a falafel, pilpul. <laughs> pilpul is, how do you explain it in English? <laughs> it's a deep, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, psychoanalysis, or, or it's like you take a Rashi and a Tosfos and you ask questions and you compare it to a different Gemara and then you give answers and questions on the answers and back and forth and back and forth. And then you say, or perhaps we can say, you make your own finish, that the answer to all these questions lies in, so every, every Maitzai Shabbos, on Maitzai Shabbos, a Bacher would say a pilpul. Friday night, believe it or not, there would be a pilpul being said in Hasidus. That is, I did it once. I was one of the, there were seven boys that were in Hasidus and seven boys in Gemara. Uh, each, they had we alternated every week. Anyways, that's that. I wanted to trade that with you. I found it interesting that since this week, the Shabbos is a very special Shabbos and a very special Maitzalei Shabbos, and I wanted to share that. Yes, Lana. Um, So Malava Maka is like, like it's considered earth, and there's like this, um, I don't know what it, where it comes from, Kabbalah, Hasidus, that like washing for this meal builds the, the Lisbon. Like yeah, the, the Lisbon is the, the doesn't... place where it will be rebuilt for yes. the resurrection. Yeah. And I don't, like, is that, not like is that real, but like how does that play into like, the Rebbe has a whole sikha devoted to that question. Okay. Uh, so we'll leave it for another time. The general idea is that Moise Shabbos has something that even Shabbos doesn't have. It's able to connect and uh, adapt the Shabbos with the rest of the week. It's, it's the adapter. So it has to be higher than both in a way. It has, has the power to connect Shabbos with the weekday in a way Shabbos doesn't even have that power. So in the weekday, compared to Shabbos, it's like Shabbos, you're alive, and the weekday is the opposite. And the ability to bring life into something that's dead is the Maitzai Shabbos meal, the Malava Malka meal. But there's a lot more than that. It says that the loose bone, uh, why it's in, in, impervious to any destruction, it can be, can be destroyed, is because it didn't have any benefit from the Eitz Hadas, 
from the tree of knowledge. The only thing that it enjoys is the Shabbos after the, is the after Shabbos meal. The Malavim connects the idea of after Shabbos meal, the connector to the idea of the Luzbon being that which starts the process of Chiesa Mason, starts the process of resurrection. But it's a, it's a long season, I'm not going to get into that right now. But like you have to wash for that to be... It has a lot of... I mean, again, yes, one should wash. It's not like an obligation the same as the washing on Shabbos, but it's, it should be done. It has a lot of great sigulot. You know what sigulot is? Uh, a lot of fortune, a lot of great things happen because of people being careful about, about the washing for a meal. It doesn't have to be, you know, in a, it could be home also. The Sikha is in volume 16, it's a huge flat Sikha. And I want to mention the previous Rebbe's name. I was named after him, so I feel a certain connection. <laughs> Yosef Yitzchak. Uh, YY, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, Tal also his name is Yosef Yitzchak. He's a lot younger than I am, but he's also named after the previous Rebbe. Um, I actually know the first person who was the first person who was given the name. Uh, I know the first Chaya Mushka who was given the name um, before hours before the Rebbeson passed away. And when she passed away in the morning, it was a you know there was a uh, Kriya Satara, and he named his child after her. The child was born before she passed away, but he was he was he was she was named right after. Um, Powerful, yeah. Um, I remember all the Chayamushkas at the Lagmoma parade. They was waving to all of them, waving to all the little baby, little, little, little two year olds. So it was the cutest thing I've ever seen. And then, I remember. <laughs> and that was just one of those, it's such an incredible sight to see the Nasi Hadur with little two year olds named after his Rebison. Very, very powerful. Um, so Yosef Yitzchak, the Rebbe only says about the name, tells you about the person. Yosef means to add and never stop adding. Do not ever be satisfied with your accomplishments. Always tra- keep on trucking and living. A sign of life is that you don't live off yesterday's accomplishments. You're continuously adding, not just adding uh, uh, quantitatively, adding qualitatively. Different level of, of enthusiasm it should go on and on and on. It's the Rebbe's motto. Uh, no day is a day of rest and stop from living and you know uh, growing in your Yiddishkeit. But it also means to spread Yiddishkeit and don't limit yourself. Where well, places that you know that relate to me. You know, I can't. I can't go to like you know Bismarck, North Dakota, or somewhere as Casper, Wyoming. Uh, it's not my cup of tea. I need maybe some other shluchim. It's not for me. And I can't deal with people that know nothing, not even all the days. I'm a scholar. I deal with giving a lecture on a very difficult passage in Gemara, or a difficult mimer, the most difficult mimer of the, of the, of the, of the Rebbe Rashab. I can't relate to teaching all the And the previous Rebbe wanted, we'll soon see in the Sikha, he wanted very much chinuch of little children. He was into the sim- most simplest teaching all the days to kids, teaching all the to kids, either kids that are you know, under passport children or 80 year olds that are like children. Not to suffice just with your level, you know, your kind of people that you would like to relate to. Yitzchak means to make laugh, make happy. Why was uh, Yitzchak called Yitzchak? She said, you're a joke. <laughs> Imagine if I, your, your mother or father calls you a name. A joke. <laughs> Yitzchak, because when, when, when Yitzchak was born, besides Sarah being so happy, all the women that were not able to have children, suddenly, things, the whole world was changed. He changed, it brought joy into the whole world. His, his birth, the first Jew who was born, uh, you know, Abramovina went through, you know, uh, was idolatrous in the beginning of his life. He, Took a while until he figured it out. But Yitzchak was born pure. He's like a Ola, a carbon Ola. First kid, first Jew to have a bris at eight, at, eight, at eight days. So Yitzchak, the first Jew, when he was born, the whole world felt it. Joy was transmitted to the entire world around him. 
That means that whatever you do, it has to be with simcha, with zeal, with zrizos, with happiness, with joy. That's the motto of Chabad, but especially the previous Rebbe was like that. The Rebbe writes about the previous Rebbe, when you go to grave sites of some tzaddikim, you're triggered sometimes with uh, bitterness or, or awe. When you come to my father-in-law's grave site, it triggers joy. I don't know, I don't feel anything. <laughs> but the Rebbe says that, you know, he knows how to feel these things. You feel a sense of joy and happiness. Now, the previous Rebbe lived. You want to know the greatness of the previous Rebbe? Look what time he lived in. Look at his nemesis, the Umazeh, the exact opposite. The two probably most evil people in the history of mankind, Stalin Yamach Shmoy and Hitler Yamach Shmoy. And he fought, had a fight. The previous Rebbe lived. He was the Umazeh, the exact incredible uh, polar opposite. His power and holiness equal their power and evil. That's pretty powerful. And he went through, he suffered more than any other Rebbe. Uh, no question about that. It was once a woman who came into Yechidis, who was there for a very long time, and the Gabbai wanted to stop it. And the previous Rebbe said, leave her alone. We have something in common. Our neshamis are related. We're both broken-hearted people. I don't know the exact words. She's broken-hearted, I'm broken-hearted. We relate to each other very well. So please excuse yourself. Mm-hmm. Getting off on of it. <laughs> I remember it was a bucker in Morristown with a, a Russian boy who was eccentric, to say the least. Brilliant, but weird. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> he had a kids with the Rebbe. And the groaner wanted to hurry it up. The Rebbe told him we're going to leave. And he told, uh, he said, I'm dealing with my neshamas. Don't intervene. These are my souls. Special, Rebbe, uh, you know, read neshamas. Knows exactly who's who. Just to add one more thing here. The Rebbe once said, every soul that comes down to earth, every child that's born, goes through this room. Every person that passes away comes through the, the neshama leaves to go back through this room. Story of all my so to help them knew exactly how many soldiers were killed in a war. And he argued against the general, said 32, then said 34. Our Rebbe was And the Rebbe, he asked, how did you know Rebbe? Every neshama that leaves this world and comes to this world goes through this room. Go understand these things. <laughs> okay, <laughs> It's the Rebbe stuff. This is not, uh, you know, but it's it's powerful. Okay, so the motto of, of the previous Rebbe was very much into simcha joy, although he lived in a time quite far from uh, wanting to be happy. But, you know, you would think what would be Chabad after the Holocaust? Let's be on the survival mode. Let's not give up. Is that what the Rebbe? How the Rebbe spoke? Let's not give up. That's it. Are you kidding? Let's use all this challenge, all the, all the darkness, and explode with light. Not just not give up. What's the Chiddush? This is the Chiddush of the Rebbe who awakened. I mean, before any great, like before the Baal Shem Tov, we had the terrible pogroms of Tach Fatat, 1648, Chalmanitsky, and then came the Baal Shem Tov, Right after the Holocaust, we had the Rebbe, our Rebbe, who pushed, changed the whole world, changed <laughs> I don't know what the world would look like without our Rebbe. I mean, I just couldn't imagine. I think the one above owes the Rebbe a tremendous amount of gratitude. And I guarantee he'll say he'll agree with me. He he owes the Rebbe a gratitude because the Rebbe saved world Jewry. Any any place in the world where Yiddishkeit is thriving comes from one place. Either directly or a little bit indirectly. No question about that. And I had a dream of the Rebbe last night, first time in about 30 years. Wow. Yeah, awesome. Powerful dream. It was powerful. He was telling me off. Oh, wow. He didn't say the word Shmendrick. He says, what is wrong with you? What are you doing to your life? What are you waiting for? And I, I loved it because I didn't know I existed before, you know. <laughs> he gave me, the other guys in there besides me, there were four of us, three all older. I was just a young little, you know, six week. And the Rebbe was looking and Focusing only on me. What is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? I couldn't look at his face. I was looking down like this. Look at me. Look at me. He said, what is wrong with you? 
I'm sure that. <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> okay, let's see the seat inside. Wow. Wait, just the seat there. Well, I forgot to get out of the you just said, like, what is wrong with you? What? That was the dream. That was it. That was what's your homework for the dream? My club? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still thinking. Still fresh, right? Still fresh. I told you about a dream I once had. Um, I think I told you. Maybe I didn't tell you. Yeah. There was a, a friend of mine. I'm going to the whole, whole class and go down the drain from still, but I had a friend of mine, uh, a very special Neshama. He passed away now, but he was always sick, never got married, overweight, a lot of health issues, and until he under, uh, you know, uh, he had a terrible health issue. He was very sick. He wasn't in the hospital. He was sitting in his 1414 apartment, if you know that is, President Street. That's where the Bachrim are. It's not a five-star hotel. Probably a minus five-star hotel. It was horrific. I walked into the place to visit him on a Friday afternoon. And it was... The stench was... There were mice running all around the place, as if they owned the place. During the day, these are night, they're nocturnal mice. They don't, if they show themselves during the day, that means they own the place. And it's infested. And he's sitting there, who cares, mice, mice. He's just sitting, wants to hear, he's trying to tell me a story. And I'm working so hard not to show him that I can't to tolerate the smell, the stench. And I'm a little uncomfortable with mice running around. Well, a lot uncomfortable. Um... But I was there for 45 minutes. It was 45 minutes of torture. I walked out. Whew, wow. He was so happy I came. He giving me brothers. He said, thank you so much. That Friday night, I had a dream, which I never had anything like that before in my life. A dream with the Rebbe Maharaj. There is no picture of the Rebbe Maharaj. And the Rebbe Rashab, as a child, learning with each other. And as I'm looking at the at the Rebbe Rashab's eyes, his eyes become more blue and more blue and more blue until there's sparks of light coming out of his eyes. And it's like, ooh, and I see Galayton, and I'm there, and I witness, wow, now we understand what it says in Chassidus, that the pleasure we have down here is a joke compared to the pleasure that exists in the upper worlds, and that it's infinite and you can't even describe it. And then I look down and I see people running around foolishly, pursuing all their tithes. And I'm looking, and they're going around in circles. <laughs> Idiot, what are you doing with your life? What are you doing? You don't know what you're missing. <laughs> in my dream. And I look at the eyes again, and the eyes are going, shh. Anyways, I woke up finally. Woof. And I davened like I never davened before in my life for about a week. It had an effect. I remember when I came to the yeshiva to, to, for praying for the boys. Boys don't cry as, as easily as girls. So I, I was, was fresh. And I started tearing, you know, and going very, getting very emotional. And you heard sobs, of the boys sobbing. So that's many years ago. Not going to work right now. <laughs> it has worn off. But I can tell the story, you know. In, so I, why did I have this dream? So I figured, wait a second, maybe it was a lollipop present I got because I had a little self-sacrifice to help the sick. And this guy was into the older generation. He loved the rebellion of the past. He was into the past. His closest friends were 85, 90 and more. A 70 year old was too young for him. He loved to hang around older Hasidim. He was, he was my age. I only about 40 years ago, 30 years ago. So I was young then, you know, and he was also in his 30s, 40, and he hung around with 85, 90 year olds. His best friend was 102, you know, he just loved to talk with them. And he, he was like a sponge. He, 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 everything he heard, he swallowed and he absorbed and he remembered. He, he's like an incredible historian. And I remember um, <laughs> my father brought, he used to live in New Jersey where I was brought up, but I, I my father was a rub there. My father was Makar of him, but he was Makar of himself. He actually became from on his own, which is, shows a special neshama. And he was so excited to come to Lubavitch Yeshiva, and right away spoke to the rub, Rabbi Salman Shimon Dvorkin. He was an older rub already. He was a rub before, you know, for many, many years. One of the 
you know, an old timer who lived in Lubavitch many years ago. And this Yisrael Mordechai was his name, would have an argument with the Rav about things that happened to the Rav. And the Rav said, you know what? I think you're right. Two weeks of being in Lubavitch Yeshiva, he absorbed like a sponge, everything, all the history of Chabad. It was an amazing, unbelievable neshama. Uh, suffered a lot. But this is, uh, so I figured maybe because I, I uh, you know, made him feel good. So Hashem rewards you with something that you would never, ever dream about, which is the feeling of pleasure is going on in Gan Eden with Rebbe Maharash and Rebbe Rashab. <laughs> Anyways. Okay, we have a secret alert. <laughs> Okay, Yom, this is from volume 16. Last year I did from volume 6, volume 16. Anyone, everyone has? It's in Hebrew. Anyway, there's more here. Well, it's only 10 after, it's only half. <laughs> I did prepare this first class. I was told very late that I have to be here instead of Rabbi Glick. So I did. usually I prepare a class Monday evening, Monday afternoon, Monday evening. And I was told quite late, so. We'll forgive you. Sorry, you only have 34 minutes. Stop counting time. Yeah, but it's Malika. Stop counting. Okay. Yoyim okay. HaYistalkos okay. HaTzadik, page 149, the first page. Yoyim HaYistalkos HaTzadik, Limud HaYiroas Al-Avayda Sa'odon. The passing of a tzadik is a lesson in Avayda. Mash Ma'usa is for Yom HaYilula, the implication of a uh, Yom Hailula, which is a yard site, and his talcos and passing of a tzaddik, as we all know, is a day in which Shebo, in that day, Olim kol maso betoroso babadosa shaoba bakoy mechayev. As we said before, all that he had done, all his activities, all his Torah learning, all his service, serving Hashem, like in Davening, Asher Ava, which he served God all throughout his lifetime, kol yamechayev, it all comes to head. Um, he be eager his bonaim with my saw, but you don't We should contemplate, meditate, ponder on the things that he did. Who did of uh, Baal Hailula, the Maisim, the Torah, and the Avoid of Shel Baal Hailula. What's in, why is it so important today in order the Hasik to come to a conclusion? Mikach from, from what he lived with, a lesson for our daily lives. For whom shall call echad mihaholchim ikvosa? For all those that follow in his footsteps, b'masa b'tirosa b'avedosa shaladam in his actions, in his Torah learning, and in his avoda. So I'm going to the next paragraph. The Rebbe is going to ask, but well, he did so much. What, what subject do we pick? And the answer is, look at the mimer because the mimer of Basi Lagani, which you probably are learning now. Uh, you all know that this mimer was meant to be learned on the day of his passing not because he predicted his passing, but because his grandmother passed away. Rebbe Tzim Rivka, Baba Rivka, as she was called, the Rebbe Marash's wife, the fourth of Baba Rebbe's wife, was the, the, the grandmother of the previous Rebbe, she passed away on Yom Shvat as well. And he wanted, in honor of his Baba, that a mimer should be learned. But what was the mimer all about? About, I have come to my garden. This world is a garden. After what he went through, after the, after the previous Rebbe went through hell. That's a mild term. And he called this world, this wonderful world, it's not a jungle, it's a garden. I would call it a jungle if I would be him. A jungle out of, out of control. You know, you can see it now also. The world's going crazy. And he called it a garden. He saw right through all this mess, all this, you know, craziness. He saw its potential, how it could become a garden, not just a, a house. A garden is a place for pleasure. A garden, not just a you know, field, a garden with beautiful, an orchard, trees grow. So this is what he saw. Um, you know, the first word, bussy, you probably heard, bussy, I have come. Yeah? What have you heard? No, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Bays, how do you spell bussy? Bays, Aleph, Tov, Yud. It has to do with Chitas and Rambam. The Bays is gracious. The first letter of the Chumash. The Aleph, how do you spell Bossi? By Bayes, Aleph, Tov, Yud. The Aleph is the first letter of Tilim, Ashray. The Tov is Tanya. And the Yud, the first letter of Rambam is Yisod HaYesodos, starts with the Yud. So the first letter of Chumash, Tilim, 
Uh, uh, Tanya Rambam is the same four letters of Bossi, I have come. The Yud suffix, the Yud is I, the I. And you know that the mimer begins with um, the the, uh, the words are, are words from Shira Shiru, and they are taken from a medrash. But guess who the author of the medrash is? The one who says that the gan means a garden, and uh, you know the place where I was there before. His name is Rabbi Menachem, the son-in-law of the Nasi. It's a previous Rebbe's mimer, and the Rebbe re reviewed it when he became Rebbe. We know the Rebbe's name. We know he's the son-in-law of the previous Rebbe. So the author of the Medrash that comments on the Pasuk, Basin Lagani, his name was Menachem ben, uh, Menachem, the son-in-law of the Nasi. That's what it says there. Okay, anyways. So, if you want to know what to focus on most, let's see the next paragraph. Kibon she'etzel kol Yehudi, Rabbim heim, since concerning Jews, there are so many things that good things that people do. How much more so a leader of, of the Jewish people for sure has a multitude of things that he did in his life that are all great. So what should we focus on? The Allah has come of the come, how much more so it's a Nazi Israel. Therefore, there's so many things to focus on, we sometimes get lost. Lo Tamid Barur, it's not always clear, the Galui and revealed to us. What is his most important and primary thing he, that stands out in his lifetime? Which from that most important aspect of his life, we have to learn a lesson. That's in most cases, but in our, with our case, with the previous Rebbe, we have an easy way to understand by looking at his mimer, the mimer he gave out for the day of his passing. And what does the mimer talk about? It talks about, as we mentioned in the next paragraph, in the next uh, chapter, rather, base, it talks about the importance of not wasting time. Don't say, don't put off something for tomorrow. You never know when your time to go is. Sounds a little morbid. And even if you are going to live a lot longer, you have no right to push off a day because every day is a gift. And you can't get back time. People are worried about loss of money, which they can retreat, get back. But people don't worry about the loss of time. Adam Doeg al Ibud Domov, person worries about the loss of his money, does not worry about the loss of time. Time is very precious. It's a gift. Every moment is a gift. I'll do it tomorrow. But what today is a gift. You can even throw out the gift out the window. Doesn't work that way. So even if you do have time, you're going to live another 50 years, don't push off something you could do today, tomorrow. Every day has to be filled with accomplishments. We say a person should live a long life. Don't really mean a long life. Longevity, years wise, would mean every day should be a long list of things that you have accomplished. Some days more, some less, but every day you have a list of what did I accomplish today, either personally or helping others. That's called having long days. Long days and long years. Long years mean you live a long life. Long days means every day of my life was long. Or we lack time, taking 24 hours and utilizing every moment of the time. You know how you succeed? If when you're into something, you're not thinking about something else. <laughs> when you're learning this class, you're not thinking about, what do I have to do now for now? If you start thinking about later, now, then your now is messed up. Be focused completely on what you're doing as if there's nothing else in the world that's on your mind. That's called a panini. But the Rebbe was that way. Here I go again. The Rebbe, when he would, <laughs> when he would talk to people, you're the only person that, that counts. As if there's no one else in the world except you and him devoting his whole energy just for you. And the next person, now I'm taking everything, goodbye, next. <laughs> That's not easy. In, in Yechidis, for example, I hope I'm not boring you. In Yechidis, you know how difficult it is for the Rebbe to give you, what, what's Yechidis? Hi, here are your problems, you know. No, the Rebbe is entering into your life, empathizing and understanding exactly how to figure you out. He has to go in take off his, metaphorically, his clothing, Rebbe, and then get into your life. And that's difficult. And then next person comes in, a totally different kind of problem, issue. People are different, like, you know, right, uh, it's night and day. You have all, all walks, people all walks of life. 
I'm waiting for the day when no one leaves the class in the middle. That will never happen. I think I think transformation will happen faster. <laughs> I'm not blaming anyone. I'm just <laughs> I don't have anything, sorry. Everyone does. It's okay, it's okay. I'm used to it. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Um well, I think. Um, okay, not important. Let's go right there. We know the importance of Simcha. There's a Gemara in Masech Tainis, where Rabbi Broca, his name was, meets Elio Anavi and asks, Can you give me, can you find me people here that are automatically going to Abu Haba? You know, straight, um, express, no stops anywhere else. Anyone in the street right now you can point to? So he pointed to two comedians. They weren't exactly Torah scholars, but they love to make people happy. Some comedians are bored in their own life, and they have uh, their their you know they have misery in their own life, so they have to become comedians. No, these are comedians that cared about making anyone who was not so happy happy. They made peace between people that were fighting, like Arana Cohen did, and they always made the best clean jokes that you could possibly imagine, and got people on it, you know refreshed and happy again. So really, they were simple people. And Eliyahu, he said, these are the two people right here. Are you looking at these two comedians? Well, he, he, he didn't say they're comedians. He just said these two people. And then my broker ran over to them. Hello, what do you do for a living? We're comedians. Really? That's it? What do you mean? What, what are you learning? We just make people happy. That's all we do. That's our job. Uh, you know, we get paid for it, but this is what we really enjoy doing, making other people happy. So Yitzchok, joy is a very, very important thing, not just to yourself to be happy, but also it should be contagious, make other people happy. You see people smiling, you see a happy person, you want to also, it, 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 it evokes happiness in other people too. Happiness is contagious, it's like life. Okay. I know I don't personify that so much, <laughs> but it, uh, it, joy is a very, very important, it's not easy to be happy. So if it would be easy, it wouldn't be so great. That's why Simcha Serda comes at the end of all the holidays, after Yom Kippur. Simcha Serda, in a way, is a, even greater than Yom Kippur because it comes at the end. It's, it's the highest rung of a ladder to really rejoice, and be super happy, and go out of, your, out of your limits, out of your boundaries. Simcha breaks through all boundaries. Joy breaks through boundaries. You transcend yourself. I always mention the kind of joy people think of joy is just the opposite. Start drinking and you get that, you go wild, you lose control of yourself. That's losing control of yourself. Simply is when you gain such control that you go beyond yourself, beyond your limitations. And you could be happy and you could, you know, even someone you didn't, you don't like for some reason, eh, forget about it and forgive the person and not be. That's called trans, real joy. Joy is when you're able to transcend all your limitations. Okay. Let's see, speak a little further. Um, <laughs> what was that about? Hi, Rabbi. Who's that? <laughs> who am I saying hi to? Allie. Allie. I don't know who Allie is, but... Uh, you do. I have blonde hair. I'm there sometimes, and today I'm not. <laughs> okay. oh, hi, everyone. Know. <laughs> Hi, back. What? I didn't mean to. No, no, no. You. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. You need a little uh, pause here. People get bored, so you're, it's good. It's good. Okay. Take a look at the Sikha on page one fifty. What happened? I don't prepare anything. It's what happened? Okay, page one fifty. Gimel. <laughs> Um, no. However, so again, the previous step is all about spreading, adding, and simple and joy. And don't waste time. Do things now. Don't wait till later. So he says like this. Um, what exactly is is that which we have to do with simple? What's the most important thing in our in our uh, lives? The, our, our most important part of our lives is fulfilling the purpose as to why we why God created the world in the first place, and that is, as we all know, to make a deed of to make a dwelling place for the one above down here. And there are three three words that are used: dira, a dwelling place, 
a place where God can feel at home, established as his home. God himself, not some of his manifestations, not godliness, holiness, but the source of all the holiness and all the godliness, which is God himself, Hashem. The essence, Atmos, not any kind of revelation, uh, powerful revelation like you have in Gan Eden, not that. The source of where everything comes from. That's he, that's the he who wants to have a dwelling place. Not some kind of fancy world called Olam Silus, or even the higher worlds. No worlds, nothing, just God himself. And he wants to have a dira, a home. What does a home mean? When, you, when you're at home, you feel at home. You can just be yourself. Be yourself. And a dira also is a place that's here to stay. A hut, you know, some, you know a place, a bungalow you have is only for the summer, then you leave. A house is what's meant to be constant, no changes, consistency. And we're down here in this world, down here. So God himself wants to have a home where he can feel comfortable, be his full self, not no masks, no camouflage, down here in this lowly world. Okay. So the Rebbe says in the Sikha, having mentioned these three ideas, it's God himself, Hashem, the Atmos, Lo Yisbarech, Lo, Lo is the Atmoso. Dira, a, a dwelling place, betachtonin. So here's where the Rebbe, I'm going to get to the most important part of the Sikha. Um, what I just said now is, is throughout page 150 and 151. Now let's go look at Dawah, page 151 now. Shlosha What are these three things of doing things for God's sake, having Him in mind, nothing else, no other fancy type of enjoyment, but just to be connected to the one above in his full essence, to make a dira and to make a dira down here. So he says, the fees that move on based on what we just said about the three aspects of dira betachtoinim, gam le gabi avoda. So we can also apply that in avoda. Shahasiya lo yizbarach dira betachtoinim, that the making of a dwelling place for God down here, sericha li hisbatseya, has to be put into practice, uh, materialized, but often kazeh she yasim li zira la smusa yizbarach davke betachtoinim. As he explains, what does it mean that you're doing things for God's sake? A person could serve Hashem. There's a different level. The level goes up the ladder here. The lowest level would be, I'm serving Hashem to get some kind of payback, reward. What kind of reward? Material reward. <laughs> That's what I relate to. A higher level? No, I don't care about pure material. That's an Irish guy. I want, I don't have a, I want spirituality. I love, if I could have a great learning experience, or like experience that I had, wow, feeling a, a tiny gruchni, uh, that's why I'm serving God, to get that. Not to get any mundane reward. Sounds a little bit better, but it's still far cry from serving Hashem. You're serving yourself. Spirituality is what you're interested in. That's, that's your personal interest. Thirdly, I want to serve Hashem. I want to be connected to Him. I want to be connected to Him. Sounds even better. Devekus in Him. Just be connected. Wow. But it's still personal. I want to have this experience of connecting to God Himself. Level number four. I don't want. I want Hashem to be happy. I want to be able to have the schus of making Hashem happy. Not me happy, Him happy. But I want to cause Hashem happiness. The ultimate. The ultimate is I want Hashem to be happy, whether I cause or someone else causes. It's equal to me. I'm not into me accomplishing God being happy. God's happiness is all I care about. Whether it comes through me or someone else, it's all the same. There's no me in the picture at all. It's completely selfless. You get it? There's not even the, the uh, motive of I want to make God happy. I want to make God happy. I don't feel the same when you make God happy. It's the I. I, I need that type of you know satisfaction of knowing that I caused a pleasure for the omnipotent, for the for the uh, for the Abish himself. Wow! So that's still self-serving. The ultimate is when it doesn't make a difference if it's me or someone else, because for Hashem it's no difference. He cares for every yid equally. So how about that? That's the ultimate kavana. This is the highest madrega in serving Hashem. 
You're completely selfless. It's all about him, not about me on any level. And then there is Dira. Dira means, as we said before, something that's here to say. My avoid is not going to be today I avoid and tomorrow I'm going to fluctuate and get into our moods, you know, good mood, not such a good mood. No changes. Consistency. That's number two. <laughs> number three, get involved in things that are, are below your dignity sometimes. Teaching olive base or dealing with people that are really at the uh, brink of, the, between Yiddishkeit and the opposite. Getting involved in the kind of nitty gritty, you know, uh, really getting yourself dirty in a way. Dealing with people that are very coarse. Ah, it's not for me. Tachtoinim. Don't feel any different if you're giving a lecture to the greatest scholars and you're really enjoying the, the back and forth. Learning Hasidus and Gemara, going in depth and really enjoying, this is your cup of tea. This is your, this is, this is what you relate to. You're not going to be able to switch easily. If, if you're into yourself, you're going to find a difference between learning with someone on this level versus someone learning learning with, with little children. Children, I have to discipline them. I want to teach, teach children. I want to teach adults. I don't feel the same when I, you know, when I do this good thing or that good thing. So there's no consistency. Again, if you're into yourself, you're not going to be able to make a dira. You're not going to be able to make Hashem dwelling here permanently because there's going to be ups and downs uh, in your life. And also you're going to pick and choose what you like to get into, what part of Yiddishkeit you enjoy and what you don't enjoy so much. So here's what the Rebbe says, but the previous Rebbe, everything was equal. The previous Rebbe, he had Mesiras Nefesh, beyond any calculation whatsoever for all those three. He cared about so much about children and learning, teaching kids. He was much a Nefesh himself, and he sent other people on a mission of self-sacrifice. And many of them were exiled to Siberia. Many of them were eliminated, were, were lost their life. And you can imagine how difficult it was for the Rebbe to send his own Hasidim on a life and death mission, especially seeing how one of his chassidim didn't make it. You can imagine what, how that affected him. And he had to continue, no stopping, continued. And the question is, what it was, you'd have much more success because the, the, the KGB cared more about not allowing schools to open up for kids. They realized that's the most important part of Judaism, the next generation. If you would have just focused on what you think you could have success in, listen, it's not going to work. And it's going to cause danger to everything. Why, why not work with things that you have more chance of having being successful? That's calculation. His Mesiras Nefesh was not calculated. Was It's my child. If your child is in danger and you, know, you can't swim, but the child is, you know, there's no one else to help you, and the child is drowning. What are you going to do, even though you can't swim? Somehow you're going to manage to try to save the person's life. But wait a second, you'll drown also. Uh, who, who can think about that? The previous ever saw Judaism was drowning. He couldn't stop. And he didn't make any calculations. What's going to be this? What's going to be that? There were many, many of the, the you know, great scholars who disagreed with him and thought that he's doing something wrong. He had to, he had to fight them. Just like Joseph, his name was Yosef. His, the brothers couldn't understand Yosef. They didn't think, his, they thought he's doing something wrong. They didn't realize his greatness. And the same is true with the previous Rebbe. He focused his, he, his whole life with Mesir HaSnefesh. And the different Sikha, the Rebbe said, there were three, three decades of his life that were very different. For the first 10 years, um, there was his suffering in prison. Uh, there were 10 years of, you know, when he was fighting the KG with, with, the, you know, with the Russian government. Then when he came to America, um, he had a fight, the, Amer the American Klippa, that here it's different. Mind your own business type of thing. You know, America is different. We're not old fashioned. He had to fight that off. And that was very difficult. Uh, and everything was, his, his first words were, America is not any different. And he, and he won, he succeeded. Look at, look how, look how America became a, a, a uh, you know, a fortress for Torah learning and for Yiddishkeit. So this is what the Rebbe focuses on in the Sikha here. Now I want to just, since it's late, um, we have to focus on halacha, very much halacha. We need rabbis. We need rabbis. I know a lot of scholars that know how to learn, but when it comes to a question, there's no one to ask. 
I mean, halacha questions. We're not talking about halacha questions, you know, in the, you know, the everyday ones, the more difficult ones, the serious ones, the marriage, divorce questions. For example, that we have today, people that are can't even recognize bodies. God forbid, no more fun. There's, there's, what about the wives of these men? Are they allowed to remarry? Not so much. It's a horrible situation. You need Rabbanim to Paskin. And the Rebbe says, we need, to, the previous Rebbe was so much into having rabbis who know how to pass a halacha in all areas of Torah, not just in certain easy stuff, you know, the Yalva Yalva Shmanesri part, you know, what bracha to make on certain foods. We need to, you know, answer to questions that are very, very difficult. In all the areas of Shulchan Aruch, a focus on children, so much on Chinuch. We have the Wednesday hour, it's all based on the previous Rebbe's the release time hour every Wednesday. The previous time I started it. Children, 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 kids, get kids to be involved in Yiddishkeit. Um, so this was the Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe was so much into, the Sikha talks about. Uh, we're not going to finish the Sikha, not even, just almost didn't do anything here. Um, he did, one more thing, he did mention that we should make sure that we should focus in the schools on not the secular studies. Try to avoid having to do that. If you can't, Put it at the end of a day instead of the beginning of a day. The child's mind is fresh. Fill his mind with Torah learning. And then when he's already tired, then you can have some secular studies if you want. You know, if they insist, you have to have secular studies. Kids right now, you should know. My brother, by the way, he's pretty smart. As you can see from his writing. Never went to high school. <laughs> you know, you go to high school. Uh, Manus Friedman, I think he's an elementary dropout. Yeah. You have to Jacobson, huh? Why, why Jacobson is pretty smart, no? Mm -hmm. You can hear him speak? Okay. High school dropout, only tell you to kid. I don't even think he went to elementary school. <laughs> uh, okay, these are brilliant people, but there are many others. I have a, you know, a, a nephew who's a multi, multi millionaire, thank God, host of a billionaire. Never went to school. He's doing pretty well. <laughs> uh, and he's not a brilliant. Uh, I mean, I, I give you case after case after case. I have another nephew who went to college, you know, and until recently he was going, you know, looking for Parnosa. <laughs> to learn how to read and write doesn't take much, you know. Read and write, I'm not talking about the girls so much, more the boys. The girls are also uh, obligated to, you know, uh, the Rebel once said that even though girls don't have an obligation to learn Torah, except for the, the things they need to know for mitzvahs, not. Torah for the sake of just Torah learning, but secular studies can sometimes harm a person's mind. It can cause the mind to think in a certain way, which creates doubt about Hashem. It, it, it can cause, depends what thing, how you're learning it, but it cause it contaminates the mind. I'm not saying that one should not at all. You have, you're learning for your you know, for your future, Parnasso, whatever. But just the study for a secular studies itself has has an ability, the opposite of what Torah can accomplish. Especially if you learn the parts of science that are heresy, completely, uh, you know, heretical. But even if you don't, some of these this stuff just causes a blockage in being able to, to understand things that are more pure and spiritual and heavenly. Uh, so even that... There is a school here at Crown Heights, I don't know how organized it is, where the girls also don't learn English until they get older than the, then they have a uh, you know, certain, they get tutored, they learn here and there, and they end up knowing pretty well. Um, and they're not uh, illiterate. They know how to read and write, they know they know math, they know everything. They don't have all the knowledge of history and all the scientific theories that you're anyway not going to use. That they don't have. But the basics you have, you have to have to be able to communicate with other people, they have. Well, I'm saying it's probably very not popular. <laughs> Anyways, that's what happens when I don't prepare a class. Yeah. Okay. I still have a question. <laughs> um, okay. What, like, you're saying that the Rebbe in the Sikha is like saying, or the Kudikar Rebbe is saying that, um, that like, that it's so important to do all these things, even if you're not inclined to do those things, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're doing for Hashem's sake and for your sake. What? If you're thinking, if your mind is completely devoted to Hashem's will, not to your own will, right. then it'll, then you'll anything that needs to be done for Yiddishkeit, you'll be doing it with the same passion. Right. 
And how does that fit into like what we're taught or about, you know, your Nishama has a certain mission in this world and has certain inclinations. We're supposed to use that for godliness and to, to make this world a dwelling place for Hashem. Right. So I have certain like inclinations to do certain mitzvahs and to be in a certain area. Go for it. And to expand that. And for example, if, 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 but should I be running to do my opposite inclination? No, but I'm saying. Like, nullifying myself that Hashem will, like. You know, when, it, when, it, when it calls for it, when there's a call for it, I'm not saying each person should give up everything you're doing. If you have talent in music, let's say, or in art, and you could, uh, you know, spread your sky that way with your voice or with your artistic, you know, talents or whatever talent you have, uh, yeah, go for it. And it might be a sign that your neshama has a connection to that. But we're talking about when when situations come up where you're needed to teach someone. Uh, so if you're ready, whatever I have to, whatever call, what the time calls for, I'm here, I'm ready for it. And without any hesitation, that's what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. That's not a contradiction to people have different talents and they should use their talents, not everyone the same. Yeah, you have different tribes, Reuben, Shimon, Levi. Of course, your main book. The previous step was a rabbi, so he had everything. He was all inclusive. Right. Yeah, but every person should be ready. That if, if you're called on duty, it's like, it's like a soldier called for war, ready for it. And with the same fervor that you would do things that you easily relate to because it's part of your nature. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Uh, sorry? Which volume? 16. Volume 16. It was, the secret was said in Tavshin Lama Zayin. Hi. It was said in 1977. Yeah. 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 Y